You're going to love Saver Online Classes. We add a new tutorial to the library weekly. You have unlimited access. And if you like my style, my explanations, you can learn so much more. In this recipe, I'm creating a delicious chocolate, hazelnut and orange cake. We have chocolate cake, which is laid with hazelnuts. We're going to cut that into three. Piped inside is an 80% chocolate buttercream spiraled with an orange creme patissiere, caramelized hazelnuts and caramel. They're all layered together. It's finished with the chocolate buttercream and then garnished with some chocolate curls. Now, before you start this recipe, you may want to watch our tutorial on chocolate tempering. I'm going to start with the baked cake. When you're baking cakes, a lot of it is in the preparation, not only of the batter, but also the cake rings or tins that you're using. Now, I do much prefer a cake ring because I find it very easy to remove the product. And I can use this for both mousse cakes and for baked cakes as well. These are 180 millimeters each. So what I'm going to do is lightly oil the cake rings. I just sprayed in one spot because it does tend to go everywhere when you're spraying. And then I just wipe it around the ring. Now what I've done is I've got a piece of baking paper and you can see here I've actually traced the size of the ring here. And then I have sections around the edge which are feathered. You don't have to cut them that small. But just as long as when we put it in, we get a little bit of a lip where we have feathered the paper. We then have a strip of baking paper, slightly higher than the cake ring. So all the dimensions for your cake ring are in the recipe that you can have a look at. Make sure you push the paper out so you haven't got any air trap between the paper and the cake ring. Now in this recipe, I'm demonstrating two cakes, but your recipe is only for one. So you're not going to have the same volume as me. Now that we've got that done, we can set that aside and we're going to start first with our meringue. When you're making a meringue, it is best that your egg whites at a minimum are at room temperature, but if you can leave them out overnight, you'll get a much better result, even if you leave them out for a few hours. So I'm going to place the egg whites into the bowl. Make sure the bowl is really clean and doesn't have any residue of fat in it because that will limit the egg whites ability to whip up. The other thing that will limit the egg whites ability to whip up is if it has any particles of yolk. So make sure there's no yolk in there at all. We have cream of tartar we're going to put in. If you can't source cream of tartar, you can replace it with a little bit of salt, vinegar or lemon. It's the acid that we're looking for, which will help to bind the protein and water together. Now, when we're baking with egg whites, we start mixing slowly and then we gradually increase the speed so we get an even incorporation of air so we don't get any large air pockets that can rise and lift up during the baking process. So I'm just going to start this slow and gradually increase it. Once we're at a medium peak, which I'm going to show you that consistency, we're going to start adding the sugar. Don't ever stop your meringue like I am now before you add the sugar, but a lot of you ask me what is a medium to firm peak. You can see it's a little bit porous because I haven't stabilized it with the sugar yet. I'm talking fast to get this information out, but I'm just gonna show you what it looks like. So it will hold on a whisk, but don't stop the mixer to have a look, but it should look white, so it shouldn't look open in texture. It should be quite closed in texture, but it won't be really glossy until we add the sugar. Now, don't you be stopping your mixer like I did. That's just to show you because when you stop it, you will lose some air. I'm going to now gradually add in the sugar. Don't add the sugar in too quickly because you can knock out a lot of the air in the egg white. Add a little bit. Let that have some impact and start to dissolve. And then just keep adding it in parts. Once you've added all the sugar, keep whisking for at least a minute to ensure that you enable time for all that sugar to dissolve and have a stabilizing effect on the egg white to create a meringue. Now I wanna show you the difference here where before it was quite porous before we added the sugar. You can see here we're reflecting light beautifully and the texture and structure of the meringue once we add the sugar becomes much tighter which is great. We've got really small, consistent air incorporated. 
So when we bake, that air will expand and give us a beautiful lightness to our cake. We're going to set this aside and use the same mixing bowl to start the batter for the cake. So this is okay to stay at room temperature for say half an hour while we make the batter up. So it's a good idea before you start the meringue to weigh all your ingredients for the batter so it's not sitting for too long. Now you know why I told you to weigh all the ingredients for the cake before you start the meringue. It's going to be well worth it. Usually if it's got a lot of ingredients in a cake, it's going to be fabulous. Now I'm going to whisk the eggs. So I'm going to place them in the mixer. Once again, it's best if these aren't cold, together with some sugar and some inverted sugar. Now the reason why I've added inverted sugar into this recipe is to enable us to hold on to the moisture within the cake. So to keep it moist for a little bit longer. Now if you can't get inverted sugar, that's no problem at all. Just replace the same weight of the inverted sugar with additional sugar. Now I'm going to whisk this until it becomes light and fluffy. While I'm whisking that, I'm going to heat the chocolate and the butter together, which I've already melted. I'm going to heat them up to about 45, 50 degrees Celsius. You don't have to start this one off slow, so we can put it full speed at the start. This is what we're looking for, for the mixture to be light and creamy. Now remember, I'm making two cakes, but you're only going to be making one. So you're going to have half this volume of mixture. I have the chocolate and butter here, which is liquid and nice and warm. I'm going to set that to the side. I have some cream as well, which adds a lot of moisture to the cake. So I'm going to add a little bit of this mixture to the cream. And I'm going to fold it through to bring it to a similar consistency. If we just pour the cream in, it tends to run to the bottom and then we're likely to knock out too much air by incorporating it. But this way, we bring it to a similar consistency before adding it in. So just gently fold that through. Now I'm going to do exactly the same with the chocolate mixture. Add some of the batter in. Just gently fold that through till we're achieving a similar consistency. Place that in. Now I'm using a 70% coverture, which is going to give us a really beautiful, rich chocolate flavor throughout the cake. Now if you can't get the 70%, I'm using a 70, 30, 38. So it only has 38% cocoa butter, which it's quite a thick, viscous chocolate. So it's great for baking with but it's not so good for tempering and using it on its own. You can replace that with another dark chocolate. Now I'm going to sieve the dry ingredients. So I've got some plain or all-purpose flour, Dutch processed cocoa powder. I use the Calabart one. Baking powder, which is going to help to give us a little bit of a lift. And I'm going to sieve these ingredients together. I'm going to add a little bit at a time to our mixture. Gently folding it through, trying to maintain as much air as possible. Don't worry if it's not 100% mixed in at this stage because the more we mix it, the more air we knock out. I'm going to add these ingredients now. We've got some lightly roasted, roughly chopped hazelnuts, so the skins are removed. I roast these at 160 degrees Celsius for about 10 to 15 minutes until they are golden. Then you can rub them in a tea towel to remove the skin. Hazelnut meal, which is ground hazelnut, some sea salt, and some chocolate chips. So these are the Calabart milk collets that I've just roughly chopped. I'm just going to give that a little bit of a mix. I'm going to gradually add that in. Look at all that texture in there. Now you can replace some of those inclusions. If you want to add another nut, you can, or if you want to change the chocolate, if you want it to be darker and richer, you can add a dark chocolate. White chocolate, I'm never a big fan of as a chocolate chip because it doesn't bake very well. Now the meringue. So just place a third in at the start. Gently fold it through.
because this is quite a rich cake, we're going to bake it at a lower temperature. So it's 160 degrees Celsius in a fan forced oven for approximately 45 to 50 minutes. So to check when it's ready, use a skewer and place it in. It should come out clean. Once you've taken it out of the oven, let it sit for three to five minutes before turning it over so we flatten the top. I'm going to make a soaking syrup for the cake, infused with orange and cinnamon. So I'm going to place water in the saucepan, sugar, got some slices of orange. Which are going to infuse a beautiful orange flavour. I've just washed the oranges but kept the peel on. And a cinnamon quill, or you can call it a cinnamon stick. We just simply need to dissolve the sugar. Now that all the sugar is dissolved, I'm turning the sugar syrup off. I'm going to place it into a bowl and leave it at room temperature until it cools. This can be made in advance. Once it's cold, it can be stored in a sealed container in the fridge for up to three weeks. I'm going to now make a creme patissiere. We're going to start by placing milk into the saucepan. I'm going to add in some orange zest cinnamon quill and some vanilla bean paste. I'm going to bring this to a boil. That's come to a boil. I'm now going to infuse that in the saucepan for 10 minutes. Now I'm going to place plastic wrap on top. You can also use a saucepan lid. I only use plastic wrap if you don't have gas because gas heats the side of the saucepan and the plastic will melt. So I'm going to leave that there for 10 minutes. While that's infusing, I'm going to combine cornstarch with some sugar. Let's give them a whisk together. Cornstarch is our thickening agent. Now I'm going to add in the egg yolks and just whisk that together. You don't need to aerate this. You just need to mix it until there's no lumps. Our milk has been infusing for 10 minutes. I'm now going to strain it into another saucepan. Now I'm going to add a small amount of this warm milk mixture into our slurry here. This is called a slurry. Our cornstarch, egg yolks and sugar. Transfer the same whisk over into the milk. Scrape this mixture in. Now I'm going to turn the heat back on and I'm going to whisk this until it just comes to the boil. If it's going too quickly, just turn the heat down because it's so thick and viscous, it can burn very quickly on the base of the saucepan. So just keep whisking until it all comes together to a smooth consistency, which you can see here. I'm going to scrape it directly into a mixing bowl. We have to incorporate all of this butter into our creme patissiere. So you can do it by hand. I find it much more efficient to do it with a mixer with a paddle attachment. Otherwise you're mixing for quite a long time. So just add one piece of butter at a time and you just need to mix this on a low to medium speed. Now all the butter is incorporated. I'm gonna transfer this to a bowl, place plastic wrap on the surface, let it cool at room temperature before storing it in the fridge. But it is better to make it as close as possible to preparing your cake. That way your cake will actually last longer than your creme patissiere lasting longer in the fridge if that makes sense. So it'll last about four days from the time you make it. So whether that's in the fridge or whether that's as an element inside your cake. Placing the creme patissiere in a bowl. Just place the plastic wrap so it's touching the surface. Once it's cooled, place it into the fridge. I'm making a caramel. Now this is optional. You don't have to add this in, but I always like a bit of caramel ooze in my cakes. To start, we're going to add some cream to a saucepan some sea salt, but you can just use a normal table salt, vanilla bean paste. I'm going to bring this to a boil and then we're going to set it aside. Now that the cream has boiled, we set that aside. I'm going to add the glucose in to the saucepan. I've warmed it a little bit to make it come out of the bowl a little bit easier. This caramel I'm making a little bit different. I'm heating the glucose first until it becomes a little bit more liquid like it is there now. 
And then we're going to add in the sugar from group A. Now I'm going to caramelize the two together. Now as soon as this is fully caramelized, we're going to stop it cooking by adding in the unsalted butter. So making a caramel with glucose may be a little bit easier for you if you're nervous. It does need to evaporate the water that's present in the glucose but you're less likely to get undissolved sugar crystals. So we're looking for a nice light golden brown colour. You do have more control when you're boiling the glucose and sugar together, but always remember to melt the glucose a little bit before you add in the sugar. Okay, I'm going to turn that off and stop it cooking by adding in the butter. Just be careful of splashing yourself because that caramel, once it hits the skin, it will stick and it'll give you quite a severe burn. Add in your infused cream. Just be careful here of the steam. Now this is where this recipe is a little bit different. I'm now going to add in the second group of caster sugar, which will dissolve because we have enough water there with the liquid that we've added. But it's going to give us a slightly sweeter caramel without so much the bitterness, which is a characteristic of a standard caramel. So we'll add that in. Now I'm going to boil that and bring it up to 110 degrees Celsius. So I've hit 110 degrees. I'm now going to pour this into a bowl. Now while it's still warm, we're going to place plastic wrap on the surface to avoid it getting a skin and to stop it evaporating moisture. You're going to cool the caramel at room temperature this can be made up to a week in advance before you use it. It's a stunning caramel. I'm creating caramelized hazelnuts to give us some texture within the cake. Now you can leave this element out and the cake will still be stunning as it is. We're gonna place some water in a saucepan, some sugar. Before you start boiling your sugar and water, Roast the hazelnuts at 160 degrees Celsius for 10 to 15 minutes or until the skins are loose. Then rub them in a tea towel to remove the skins and keep them warm. I'm going to boil these to 114 degrees Celsius. Now this is a very small quantity to work with. If you want to make it a little bit easier, you can double the recipe. And with the extra caramelized hazelnuts, you can freeze them. Place the warm hazelnuts in now that I've reached 114 degrees Celsius. Turn the heat off and then just give them a stir without any heat. We're going to stir it until the sugar recrystallizes. Now that the sugar has recrystallized around each individual nut, I'm going to turn the heat back on. Just control the heat if it's going too quickly. Just turn the heat down a little bit. I'm going to slowly melt the sugar, caramelize it. Make sure all the sugar is fully dissolved and caramelized before we add the butter and place it onto a silpat mat. We've fully caramelized the hazelnuts. I'm going to add the butter, which helps to stop it recrystallizing. Just mix that through. Have a baking mat or some baking paper ready to pour the hazelnuts out. Just going to separate them. They'll separate quite easily because there's not a lot of sugar in that recipe. And if you're going to pour them straight out onto a bench, make sure it's a stone bench or else you'll need to put a board underneath the mat. Once these are completely cool, put them in a sealed container. If you're not going to use them straight away, you can place them into the freezer in a sealed container. In the freezer, they'll last about two months. I'm creating a chocolate buttercream. We're using an 80% coverture chocolate to give us quite a strong chocolate hit and flavor. We're going to use an Italian meringue as a base for our buttercream. For the Italian meringue, place water into the saucepan, sugar. We have some egg whites that are at room temperature because we'll get a better aeration that way. We'll place them into the bowl. Some cream of tartar, if you don't have this, you can replace it with some salt, lemon juice or vinegar going to give us a much creamier meringue. I'm going to start the sugar syrup first. Once this starts boiling, I'm going to slowly start whisking the egg whites. The trick is, is to have our sugar syrup at 118 degrees Celsius when our egg whites are at a medium peak. So the egg whites at a medium peak need to hold. 
If this is going too fast, you can add teaspoons of water to it at a time until your egg whites catch up. Once you've added the sugar syrup in, you can slowly start adding the butter. My butter is at room temperature. If your butter is straight from the fridge, start adding it in straight away. Don't add it all at once because this will split just a couple of pieces at a time. Now when you're adding the butter, it's quite easy to split the buttercream, but don't panic, it will always come back. Just slow down how quickly you're adding the butter if you see it's starting to separate and just have longer intervals between each cube of butter. If you finished it and you notice it separated, so that means it'll look grainy, a little bit like scrambled eggs. You simply place it into the fridge for about an hour, then whip it up. It'll separate a bit more before coming back together. And you can add your chocolate at that stage. You don't have to add your chocolate straight away. This is an 80% coverture that I'm adding and I've warmed this up. It's not overly hot. Have it below 40 degrees Celsius. Now with this recipe, you can add any chocolate that you want. Keep in mind, white chocolate's gonna make it quite sweet, so is milk. This is an 80% coverture, which is gonna make it really quite rich and chocolatey. So I'm gonna add this in and then start whisking again. So you can see the buttercream here, we've got a great texture. It's not separate at all. It's come together perfectly. We can now start assembling the cake. These cakes you can see are nice and flat on the surface because when they came out of the oven, I let them sit a little bit before turning them over, actually onto a flat tray rather than a cooling wire. These have cooled completely and I place them in the fridge. You can place them in the freezer if you want to store them for a period of time before cutting them, but you will need to let the cakes come back to room temperature before you actually cut it. Otherwise it's too dense to cut through when it's frozen. So I'm just gonna trim the top a little bit. I'm leaving the paper on the bottom because it makes it easier to slide. So when we're trimming, we just rotate the cake around. Just going in a little bit. I'm really just taking the skin off the top. You can see the cake is very moist. It's important that you clean your knife in between each cut. So mark the cake into three equal portions. And then we start cutting it from the top one. So first just mark it all the way around. until you meet up on the other side. Then we just start going in. Don't cut across. When you cut across, it's very hard to cut evenly. So we just rotate the cake in a circular motion. Until we cut through the middle. So we can see we've got our first layer there. Then we start on our second line. I do keep the first one there because that gives me a guide as to what thickness I should be aiming for as I go around. You do have the chunks of hazelnuts in there, so sometimes when you're cutting it might lift the hazelnut out and leave a little indent, which is no problem at all. There we have our last layer. What I'm gonna do is put a cake board you can just cut one out of cardboard if you don't have a cake board. Make sure it fits the size of the cake or is slightly smaller. And I'm going to place it on the cut side. So I'm now going to assemble this upside down. So we start with that as our first layer. We've got all the elements that we've made. Salted caramel, the orange infused creme patissiere, caramelized hazelnuts, our sliced chocolate cake, our orange and cinnamon soaking syrup, and our chocolate buttercream. First, soak the cake with our syrup. So just lightly coat it. It is a very moist cake, but this just adds a little bit of flavor and softens the cake crumb a little bit. I'm using a plain 12 millimeter nozzle for both the buttercream and the creme patissiere. 
Placing that in the piping bag and we're going to start with the buttercream first. Place the buttercream inside and then just wipe the spoon off with the hand that's underneath the bag. We're going to alternate rings of the chocolate buttercream and the orange creme patissiere. We put the buttercream on the outside because it sets the firmest. Now we do our ring of creme patissiere, as I said, the same size nozzle, so 12 millimeter nozzle. So pipe this tightly so it's close to the chocolate buttercream. And then we repeat and keep alternating the two fillings. Finish with buttercream in the centre. We're going to take the caramel that we made and place it in a piping bag with no nozzle. Just cut a small amount off the end of the bag. Now we're just going to pipe some caramel on. Sprinkle with the caramelised nuts. We've just roughly chopped them. Place a second layer on top. And then we just press the cake so it's nice and level without pushing any of the filling out. Then we repeat the layers. The reason why we use the base of the cake as a top is because it doesn't have any crumbs and I'm not going to say your cutting is not going to be straight but we're ensured that that's going to be really nice and even and straight. Once again we soak that top layer. Now I'm going to do what we call mask the cake which means we're going to coat it in the buttercream. Now we're going to mask it till it's even, but, but what I'm going for is to have some of the cake exposed, so what we call a naked cake. I'm going to have the top nice and even without the cake exposed, but on the sides a bit of the cake exposed. Now if you're ever wanting to glaze a buttercream cake, this is the steps you'll take and freeze the cake before glazing it. You can have a look at one of our many glazes in our video library for that. So I always use a straight palette knife when I'm masking a cake and put the buttercream on the side and then work the blade backwards and forwards. Okay, so put a little bit more on than what you need to start with. As you're going around, just rotate your palette knife. So just wipe it on. Then we hold the palette knife in one position and we just go around. Now this is just rough on the sides at this stage because we need to do the top first. Starting with your palette knife in the center, rotate the cake on the turntable and take off any excess buttercream. So palette knife in the center, you can see I've just got it on the angle there and just rotate the cake around and that will ensure that the top is nice and even. So rotate around then wipe it off. We then do the sides again. Taking off the excess buttercream as we go. Now what we do to level the top off once again is we take the palette knife and we bring the buttercream in. Wiping the blade of the palette knife each time. So you can keep going around wiping the sides, bringing it back up, then cutting off the excess buttercream. See how the palette knife is just angled slightly. If you're going to glaze the cake, you do need more buttercream on the sides, so it's a nice even coating of the buttercream, but you use exactly the same technique. 
I'm going to stop there because I want the exposed cake and you can keep going for hours putting buttercream on and taking it off but you can keep going until you're happy with the finished product. It is much easier with a turntable but you can do it without it just take a little bit longer. We're now going to garnish. Once you've got the cake as a base, it's really up to you how you decorate it. I'm going to keep the decorations quite simple and create some chocolate curls. I'm using a tempered milk curvature for the chocolate curls, but you can also use a dark or white. If you need some help with tempering, we've got many videos in our video library that you can watch to give you some guidance. Now chocolate curls are always best on a stone surface because it's completely flat and it's non-porous. With stainless steel, it's never going to be flat and when you're using a metal scraper, you're going to end up scraping up particles of metal. With a laminate bench, you're going to end up scraping the laminate coating off your bench surface. Even if it's just a square of stone, use that. It can be Caesar stone, it can be granite and it can be marble. So any of those surfaces are perfect. Now when you're first starting to do chocolate curls, it does take a little while for your bench to warm up. So you might start with a little patch first so your bench warms up a little bit before spreading out a larger area of chocolate. You do need to scrape the chocolate when it's at a certain consistency. So if you spread out quite a large quantity at the start, you might not get the opportunity to scrape it all up before it starts to set. I'm going to pour some of the chocolate directly onto the bench surface. Now this is what we call over crystallization. What I'm doing with a palette knife and I'm using an angled palette knife is I'm moving the chocolate backwards and forwards so that I'm generating more beta crystals than what I require and that's called over crystallization. What that means is we're going to have a little bit more elasticity in the chocolate and it won't tend to contract as much which is exactly what we're wanting when we're doing chocolate curls. Keep going backwards and forwards until it starts to go dull. You might even start off with a smaller amount of chocolate, but it's very warm in here today. I can do a larger amount because I know it's not going to set too quickly. So you can see there it's starting to go dull. Make sure you haven't had anything hot on your bench where you're spreading the chocolate or else it won't set. And that's where we stop. If you press your finger on it like I am here and you see an impression, means it needs a little bit more time before you start scraping it. What I'm going to do is place my finger here and scrape around with a scraper so I'm getting more of a spiral effect on the chocolate. Now as you're going the chocolate gets colder, the curls will become a little bit bigger. So in between creating the curls, just wipe this chocolate off your scraper each time because chocolate sticks to chocolate. So if you've got these pieces of chocolate here, it's very hard to get a clean scrape. I've done three lots of chocolate on the bench to create all of these curls. With the excess, just scrape it up. You can use these curls as well for a different application. You don't need to clean the bench in between doing each set of curls. Don't be disheartened. The first lot of curls you do don't work. It's simply because your bench is too cold. Do a couple more. The bench will slowly warm up. Hold on to a little bit of that warmth and you'll find it easier and easier each time. Now I'm simply going to remelt this chocolate and reuse it. I've transferred the cake onto my display plate. I haven't placed it in the fridge yet. When you do place it into the fridge, the buttercream will firm up a little bit. The chocolate curls, once you've done them, it's a good idea to let them sit on the bench for about 10 minutes for that chocolate just to set up a little bit more to make them easier to handle. Now I'm gonna place these on the cake. 
with a curl side flush with the edge and placing them around the cake. If you have any loose chocolate, you'll have some chocolate here that will fan out. If any of that is loose, just break it off. You'll get to a point where you'll either have to use some shorter curls like what we have here, or the ends will have to overlap or you can cut them a little bit. Now these curls are all handmade. Each one is going to be different. So one's like this, where we need cut a little bit shorter, you can just simply cut through. Even though we've just created the curls, the chocolate takes quite some time to fully contract. So you've still got quite a bit of time to actually cut through the chocolate without it shattering. Okay, so the first layer is done and you can see how quickly the chocolate curls are used up. I'm going to build this up a little bit now and continue to add them. And just set the next layer back a little bit and I'm not gonna fill it all completely. As I said, you could keep going and you can fill this whole thing with chocolate curls, but that will take at least a day to prepare all the chocolate curls. So I think this is a nice touch with the elegant but delicious chocolate curls stack there in the center. You can see that I've just trimmed some of them so that they all fit nicely. So we've got that nice feature on top of the cake. Now there's lots of things you can do to finish. You can put some berries, but if you're gonna put berries, I would put berries inside the cake as well. Because I think the garnish should always give an idea of what to expect inside the cake. We're gonna place some caramelized hazelnuts in the center. These will only be put on just prior to serving because they will dissolve in the fridge. You can keep them in the fridge for no more than half an hour because the caramel on them will start to dissolve. So we're just gonna place a few of these in the center. Of course, you can keep going with chocolate curls if you've got the time. And to finish, a very light dusting of icing sugar just in the center. Here we have my finished chocolate orange hazelnut torte. If you enjoyed that episode, you will love my channel. Subscribe today for even more tutorials on chocolate and baking. Best of all, it's free, so get on it.